Amen. Turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Psalms, chapter 119. Psalm, chapter 119. And we're going to begin in verse 105. Verse 105. Psalm, the book of Psalms, specifically the chapter of 119, is um, an acrostic. It's the Christian's golden ABCs, if you will, about the Word of God. In, those, in Psalm 119, of course, you see each uh, section done in eight verses at a time. And each of those eight verse sections begins with the same letter in the original Hebrew language that it was written in. And so, if you will, there's all of the first eight verses beginning with the letter A, so to speak, and the second section all beginning with the letter B, and so on. But what's fascinating is, all of those hundreds of verses, all of those verses are about the Word of God. It's significant, I think, that we cannot... um, underestimate as Christians, we absolutely cannot underestimate as Christians the power of the Word of God in our life. It's verses that come to your memory on your worst day that give you some hope and encouragement and inspiration. It's when you're trying to figure out what to do that the Bible can offer to you from heaven guidance on which way to go. When you're thinking everything's good and, and, there's, and you've, you've, you're as good a person as you're ever going to get and, and this is all there is to that and, and, and you're thinking to yourself, well, I, I, I'm, I don't have very many sins. I just have two or three and the guy down the street, I know he's got more sins than me. When you're in the middle of that, it's the word of God that's a sharp sword that cuts and tells us the truth that we lie to ourselves about. God's word tells us what's true. And we're trying to figure out in this crazy world What is true and what is not. And God's word is the guide that we need in order to find everything that we need to make it in this life. And as we follow blessed Jesus in every step of every path that we have, we need the word of God over and over again. Friends, I, I, I don't know if you've thought about this. I don't know how many sermons you've listened to in your life. Probably a lot, right? And if you come and and you're here every Sunday, then you're listening to a whole lot of sermons from this guy. And I'm here to tell you, every one of my sermons is based on not my opinion, nor based on a news report. All of my sermons are going to be, Lord help me, going to be from the Word of God. So if God ever encourages you from a sermon, it's always because God's words are inspirational for us, illuminating for us, necessary, necessary for us. So we turn to Psalm 119 and we read together, beginning in verse 105. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something unusual. Prepare yourself. Another strange request from Brother Aaron. Here you go. Psalm 105, 119, 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. That, that, that verse right there. I want you to repeat that several times, okay? So I'm going to read that, then you're going to say it out loud. Then I'm going to read Psalm 106, and you're going to repeat that, 105, back after that. 107, and then you're going to say that. 108, and then you're going to say that. Everybody understand what we're doing? All right, I hope you're awake. Here we go. Psalm 119, verse 105, let me read. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. You say that, please. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Just listen to Psalm 106. I have solemnly sworn to keep your righteous judgments. You say, verse 105, Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Just listen to this next one. I am severely afflicted. Lord, give me life according to your word. Say 105 with me. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Listen to 108. Lord, please accept my free will offerings of praise and teach me your judgments. Say 105 with me. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. Just listen. My life is constantly in danger, yet I do not forget your instruction. You know what to say. 
Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Listen, the wicked have set a trap for me, but I have not wandered from your precepts. Say with me, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. I have your decrees as a heritage forever. Indeed, they are the joy of my heart. Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Last verse, I am resolved to obey your statutes to the very end. Why? Because, say it with me, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Thank you for participating with me in that way. I want you to notice the things that God has when we remember that we need an eternal light, an eternal light, when we need it most. Friends, there are times where you are going through it. There are times where you are complacent. There are times where you are struggling. There are times where you're incredibly happy. In every moment, when you need God the most... He provides for you an eternal light. That means that every single day you need a little bit of light. In this dark world, you can get it. That means that every time you need a little bit of flashlight beam, a little bit of candle lit, a little bit of hope in a dark place, every time you need it, there is a forever light that can be given to you, and all you have to do is open up His Word. Every day when you need something, It is God's words, everything God has ever said. Some of the things he said through the mouth of Jesus. Some of the things he said in the scriptures. But anytime God spoke, those words have weight to them, an eternal weight to them. And they light up the way. Which way am I going to go? God can show you. What am I going to do about this situation? God can reveal to you. Lord, I don't know if you're with me. It's a verse that can remind you of what's true. If you're struggling, if you're fighting a battle of some kind in your life, it can be what God has said, because it's still true. Everything he said is still true. It can be what God has said that will give you the courage to keep fighting the battle. His word shines like a lamp, like a flashlight like a beam, and it brightly lights the correct path for you. The other paths you're tempted to walk down are darkness places that will lead you away from the Lord. You'll enjoy them. They'll be fun for a season. Sin always is. But they will be places of darkness. And I promise, because I've done it myself, I promise you will stumble when you take the off-road path Away from God's way for you. And we need the light of God from the word of God to shine and show us which way to go. And sometimes we're having a bad day and we need God to shine on a particular direction for the hope that we have to hang on to because of a verse he gave us. Because of something that was still true for us. Friends, there are at least six times in those verses, where there's a word used that represents the Bible, okay? Represents God's words. Look at verse 105, your word, okay? In the original language, that, lang- that word has a special meaning I want you to think about for a second. It's repeated, by the way, in verse 107, your word, your word. I want you to think about what that word means. In its original language, that word there has to do with words or God's communication, The things God has said. Scripture is called God's word, or maybe the sayings of God, because it is what God's mind has declared out loud. I mean, think about how how can you know what God thinks? You, You can't know all the things that he hasn't said. You can't read the mind of God. But what you can do is every time he has spoken, you see a little bit, right? A little bit of what his mind has thought. Because you're listening to his words. It's like that with your relationships around you. When they tell you what you're thinking, what, then you know what's going on in their mind. And bless our hearts, some of us men, 
just wish we could hear from the women we love a little more of what they're thinking because we're doing the mind reading game and we're failing miserably at that. But we do this in friendships too. We do this in all our relationships. But if you listen, really listen, that's my problem. If you listen and really listen to the words that somebody's saying to you, you'll know what they're thinking. You'll know how they're feeling. Friends, we need to listen to God's words because he's trying to tell us what he thinks and how he feels about us. We find it in his word. You see that in verse 105? You see that in verse 107? Look at verse 106. Your righteous judgments. Judgments. This judgments is a synonym used for God's word or the Bible, if you will. Think about that, this word. It, it judgments. This has to do with the fact that God is the judge. And when he bangs the gavel on the bench and gets your attention and says, I hereby declare, this is the way it's going to go. Guilty, innocent, or maybe he says, my judgment is, you should do this. My judgment is, here's what you need. But God, that ain't what I need. Well, you don't tell the judge what you do or don't want or need. In fact, your opinion before the judge holds very little weight. It's the judge who gets to decide what's right for us. And he is a holy judge who loves us. So when he comes down with a judgment for us, not even a guilty, innocent, just a judgment of what is supposed to be, God, I don't, I, don't, I don't understand why you would do that. He is always giving righteous, holy, and loving judgments for us. And we're to treat his word not as something to be retranslated, not as something to be thrown away, not as a dusty old book to be ignored. We're to listen to the judgments and to listen to the judge who's trying to tell us something. Look at verse 108. That word judgments is repeated again. Let's look at verse 109 and see another word here for these ideas about what God's given us in his word. Look at verse 109. You see the word instruction. Some of you might see the word law there. This word about your instruction and your law, this comes from that same word Torah. Have you ever heard the word Torah? It's the first five books of the Bible were called the Torah, right? In that Jewish in, uh, culture. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they contain all of the, the rules and laws that God's people are to follow. God gave ten commandments in two tablets of stone, written by the finger of God. Hang on. Have you thought about that? Written by the finger of God on two tablets of stone, ten commandments. They were given to Moses, and there were many other ways. Look, do this, don't do this, do this. Don't, you're going to be my people, and here's how you're going to be my people. Here's all the rules that are going to govern your Christian society. In the Old Testament, this word Torah is instructions. Have any of you tried to build something you bought from the store without following the instructions in the box? Um, some of you did, and you did it. You constructed it, and you had ten extra pieces left over. And it's still held up so far, and it may hold up for a little while. I can promise you, though, it would have been a better construction if you'd have read the directions, and it would have been a better construction if you'd have not only read the directions, but if you'd have followed the directions. And I know none of you, none of you have had a brother or sister, teenagers, none of you have ever had a co-worker, adults, who didn't listen to instructions, have you? No, you've never had one of those. Never had one of those that you gave instructions, clear instructions, detailed directions. And they listened to every one of them, didn't they? And followed them step by step, didn't they? Uh, unless they didn't. And God has given to us what we need to have a great life. A wonderful life in God. A set of clear instructions and directions. The problem is we don't like them. I mean, they're clear enough. We just like what we like, when we like it, how we like it. And we don't like to be told what to do. And we are, oh man, our hair stands up on end and we bristle at the idea that somebody would dare control us. It's a glad submission when you bow before the king and just do as he instructs. And you'll find happiness in that place if you'll do such. Look at verse 110. I've not wandered from your precepts, your precepts. That word for precepts here has these other ideas that this is the will of God. 
This is what God wants for your life. These ideas, these precepts, they come from heaven and they're for you. And if you will do these things, these ideas are for your good and they will bless your life. But you do have to listen when these ideas and precepts and instructions and procedures are given to you. And this is what God wants, the will of God for you. We're to listen to those things. Listen, there's another phrase here in verse 111. In verse 111, what does it say? It says, I have your decrees, your decrees. And when we think about the word behind that decree, I want you to think about the idea of testimony. Testimony. You, if you witnessed a crime and you had to go to the uh, judge and, and explain your witness, your eyewitness testimony, then what you would do is say, I have seen and here's what I saw. Just the facts, so to speak, and only what you witnessed, right? There is a witness in heaven named the Lord God Almighty who sees everything, and he will testify to you of what's really going on in your life. And you can ad ad accept his testimonies. You can accept these things with joy, these decrees that come from an eyewitness who has authority over you. You can listen to these, uh, these testimonies and these witness things from on heaven, and you can listen to them and obey them and follow them and say, you know what, I thought God didn't like me. But God testified and witnessed to me that he really does love me and that some of what I'm going through He's actually going to use for something good. All I can see is my tears, but maybe he's got something good planned I can't see. So if you will believe the testimonies, if you will believe the witnesses that God has given to you, then when you do that, you will recognize God's loving words in your life. Your decrees, your testimonies, your witnesses. Look at verse 112. Look at verse 112. It says, I am resolved to obey your statutes. Your statutes. In the original language, this word has to do with a law. It has to do with a statute or a prescription. Listen, this is fascinating. This same word has to do with literally carving onto metal or stone a set of laws or statutes. It's written on the paper with permanent ink that this is how it is supposed to go. The statute could might as well be literally written in stone, carved carefully by the finger of God, which literally happened in the Ten Commandments and happened in God's written words here, written by God's own hand to tell you this is the way things ought to go. And when God writes things, inscribes things, carves things onto these permanent places, the eternal unchanging God, is given us a set of rules that never, ever change for us. So we have a constancy. We have a permanence here in the laws of God that are for our good. Not for our anger, but for our good. Let's go back and look again, beginning of verse 105. And let's remember that God's word is a lamp and a light. This eternal light that we really need many, many days. We said again in verse 105, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for your path. Have you ever felt like you're walking around stumbling in the dark in your life? It's God's word that can shine a little bit of some of what's really going on and of some of what you need to know and what you need to do as a result of that. So take the flashlight of the Word of God, shine it on your situation, and let God reveal with heavenly light everything you need to see and the path you need to walk on. Look at verse 106. I've solemnly sworn to keep your righteous judgment. How many of you, when you signed up to follow Jesus, you said you were going to sign up to follow him wherever he took you, and you solemnly swore, so to speak, that this is the life for me from now on. When you turn to Jesus, when you give your life to him, and you pray to him, then after that, you're baptized. But friends, that's not the finish line. That's the starting line. The starting line is the moment you got on your knees and said, I'm done with the old way, now I'm on the new path. 
and you are solemnly swearing to give your life to the king. That's not a small thing. When we go to VBS, kids camp, youth camp, and we talk to them about the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I don't, I don't do this as if it's flippant or, or small. Even a child who gives their life to the Lord is literally determining the rest of their life. That's not a small thing. That's a big deal. And we're solemnly swearing to continue to go God's way. The problem is that we break our covenants all the time. People will go before the marriage altar and solemnly swear that until one of them dies, they're going to stay together. And something happens, or many things happen, and the covenant is broken. And the divorce comes. And I'm not making light or pointing, pointing accusing fingers. I am saying, though, that we promised, and then somehow the promise didn't work. We do this in contractual agreements with banks. We foreclose, refuse to pay. Or can't pay. We do this all the time in our friendships. I'm going to call. I'm going to call you. I'm prayer. I, I swear I'm going to call you. I swear I'm going to take. I swear I'm going to take time. I swear I'm going to fix that. I swear I'm going to do that thing around the house, baby. I swear I'm going to. Whatever the promise is, we promise. We promise. We promise. And and sometimes we keep our promises. And sometimes, well, we meant to, but we didn't. And this solemn swearing of this poet is that they're never going to change their mind. And God's never going to change his mind, so that's good. So if I'll just stick up to my end of the bargain, then verse 105, that word from God, those judgments from God, are going to be a light and a lamp that they need because they've solemnly sworn they're going to hang on to that. Look at verse 107. 107. I am severely afflicted. How many of you feel attacked? Attacked by cancer. Attacked by an addiction and a desire that you are fighting against. How many of you feel attacked by people who are causing your life to be very difficult? Because they're doing ungodly things and it's absolutely ruining everything in your world. You feel attacked. How many of you feel attacked because something that you love, someone even maybe, that you love is fighting and you don't know how to help them. And you feel attacked too because of how much you love them. 107, I am severely afflicted. Lord, give me life according to your word. That his life would be a lamp and a light, right? That the life God gives would be that when we're fighting, we'll remember from Bible verses that it's God who fights on our behalf. We'll remember that when we're fighting, that it is God who said that no weapon formed against you can prosper. No weapon can win when it attacks you, because you have the great eternal Lord God Almighty who's got your back. And so Satan can do his dead level best, and because of God, he won't win. God, instead, will win in your life. Lord, give me life. I am severely afflicted. I'm fighting. God, fight my battles for me. And it's Exodus 14, 14, 14, that comes to your mind when God told the nation of Israel, when they were at the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army behind them, and nothing but ocean in front of them, no path marked out for them to go, in a moment of panic, God said to Moses, and Moses said to the people, be still. Listen, all you have to do is be still. God says, I will fight for you. And he split an ocean in half. And they walked on to safety. So we're fighting and we're afflicted and we're in a battle. But praise be to God that God's word reminds me of who's fighting for me. Verse 108. Lord, accept my free will offerings of praise. Do you notice that the praise is not an offering of an animal sacrifice? No blood to be spilled. Because Jesus died on the cross as the Lamb of God for our sins. But we do offer Him praise. We do sing. We're a group of people in our religious faith that's all about singing. And some of us sing with the best we got, and some of us don't sing very well because we're afraid people are listening to us. But we sing, and where do you sing from? You sing from your heart. And when you give some praise to God, He hears the most beautiful song coming out of your heart. No matter what sound is coming out of your lips. And it's given, is it given 
under compulsion? Does God declare to you in a law that you have to give him offerings of praise? It's a free will offering, a gladly given from a joyful heart. God's not, God doesn't want to take my money. I'm glad to give God my tithes and offerings. God doesn't want to take my joy. God gives me joy. I give him back some joy in just a song. And God's word, God's word gives me some songs to sing. So much of what we sang today came from the Bible, friend. Given us free will offerings of praise to the Lord. And these songs, these verses, it's a lamp and a light just when I need to praise. Look at verse 109. My life is constantly in danger. Look at verse 110. The wicked have set a trap for me. I know that in the same way you felt afflicted by something you couldn't control, sometimes you are angry at somebody because they are deliberately making your life miserable. And they're doing it in ungodly ways. And it feels like a personal attack on you because it is. And who is causing them to do that for you? It's actually Satan in their heart twisting them and causing problems for you. Satan would love, Satan would love to do something that somebody else would cause you problems. Remember the life of Job. Job had a funeral with ten caskets of his ten children in a single moment. All of his family except his wife was lost from him. Job was a wealthy man with lots of flocks, lots of herds, and all of them were stolen from him on the same day. Day. And he went from wealthy with a loving family to alone with his wife with nothing to his name in a single day. And he could have, could have let Satan's attack win in his life. But just like this poet, verse 109 and 110, I'm not going to forget your instruction and I have not wandered from your precepts. I'm still in with you, Lord. I'm still on your team, God. I have no idea what you're doing. I do believe you can win this battle for me, but it looks like you're not winning the battle for me. The, the, the 12 disciples of Christ felt this exact same way too. Because the Jesus whom they loved, who was the king, the Messiah, the one they've all been waiting for, this Jesus willingly let the Romans arrest him went before them and, and was accused of stuff he never did. He was an innocent man put on a farce of a trial and sentenced to death for stuff he had never done. And his disciples said, we lost the wicked one. Satan killed the Son of God. And when he died on Friday, they spent all Saturday in fear and mourning. Until Sunday, when they went to check on his dead body and discovered that wicked had not won, that evil had not conquered. They discovered that Satan had deliberately played into the almighty sovereign plans of the Lord God Almighty, who gladly sent his son to die for the sins of mankind. And then proved to the world he was the son of God by raising him from the dead, proving that he was more than sin and more than death. So you might feel like your life is in danger, that wicked are attacking you. Hold on to who you know God to be, because he always wins his battles for you. Verse 11, verse 111 and verse 112. I have your decrees as a heritage forever. You know, I have my grandfather's Bible. He's a pastor. Little bitty churches in Neshoba County and Leake County and Scott County. Spent all of his adult life trying to help people, trying to teach the Word of God. I have a little notebook of sermons of his. It's a heritage that he and my grandmother gave to that side of the family. And we had a family funeral on that side of the family this past week. I was at youth camp. I didn't get to be there. I talked to many family members who were there. Do you know how many people are following the Lord in that family? 
It's an amazing miracle of God. Amazing miracle of God. But there's so many people in that family who are following the Lord. Some of them pastors, some of them deacons, some of them uh, leaders in their church, men and women both, who were faithfully following the Lord. And when they had a funeral for a beloved family member last week, they celebrated God in the middle of their tears for their loss. And it was because of the heritage of the Word of God that still has not changed from generation to generation to generation. And it's in Psalm 112 that the psalmist says, I am resolved to obey your statutes to the very end. In another translation, it says, I incline my heart. Isn't that a beautiful word picture? My heart looks upward, like inclined towards heaven. And my heart looks upward at the Lord, and I am resolving with a holy, heavenly insistence, with a persistence, with a stubbornness from God. I am going to, resolve to, always and forever, until I breathe my very last, obey whatever He asks me to do, until it's over for me. I want to be that poet, don't you? I want to have that resolution, that, that, that certainty that, that I want to say, just like in wedding vows, until death parts us, I'm with you. I want to say that to the Lord. I'm with you, Lord. I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen to me. And, and friends, I, I know people and you know people they're serving the Lord. They're serving the Lord in their church. They're in their Bible a lot. They're praying all the time. And this one friend of mine, I mean, his wife's leaving him. He doesn't know what to do. And he's praying, but he doesn't know what to do. And there's families, they've lost loved ones, and they're planning the funeral, and they're, 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 they're unsure of what in the world God is doing. There's people battling cancer. It looks like cancer's winning. There's people trying to pay their bills and they think the Lord's faithful to provide, but they're really not sure how. <laughs> There's people who are battling against that addictive desire and they are winning that fight with the Lord's help, but they also are tired of fighting that battle. And there are some who hate the day in and day out of this slog of a life. It's in that moment when our dedication to the Lord is tested, tested. And I want to pass that test because God taught me, Jesus said, that I am to love the Lord my God not with a little bit of my heart and not with a few years of my life. I am to love the Lord my God with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my strength. And love my neighbor as myself. I am commanded to do that. Lord, I hereby in front of all these witnesses solemnly swear and declare that I will do my best to do exactly that. And even if I fail, Lord, I'm grateful that you never fail us. So friends, I, I can't promise you what your life is going to look like. I can't promise you that you won't have to hang in there one more day by the skin of your teeth. I can't promise you that it's not going to feel like a fight to hang in there with the Lord. But just like the Psalms, I want to remind myself again and again and again from another verse and another verse and another verse and another verse about all that God has said to me so that I can love Him always with everything that I have.